Well, in our first session, we looked at sort of the history of this debate. We looked at how we've gotten to where we are and how this purposeful campaign, this pur purposeful propaganda campaign uh, through desensitizing, jamming, and conversion has gotten us to a place where um, we, we don't even feel comfortable addressing this issue of same-sex marriage um, without first apologizing for it. Uh, we don't feel comfortable with stating what it is the Bible says about it without apologizing for it. We saw who the major players were and the way they laid out this propaganda campaign, that this propaganda campaign um, was manipulative, it used lies, um, we, we, we've seen that. But now there's another side to this whole gay is the new black approach. And the other side is, again, using the civil rights line of argumentation, first you argue that homosexuals are actually um, an oppressed minority group that needs to be protected. And the second thing that you do is you, you, you recognize that if we're going to address this issue, that we have to deal with the church somehow you have to deal with the religious argument. And so the way that you do this and keep the whole line of argumentation with civil rights intact is you say, just like there were Christians who were wrong in the civil rights movement, there are Christians who were wrong in this movement as well. You see, there were Christians who used the Bible to justify slavery, to justify Jim Crow. Uh, there were Christians who used the Bible to justify all sorts of things and they were wrong. And there were other Christians who came along and, you know, they, they shone the light of truth on these lies. And it was because of that that we were able to move beyond uh, slavery, Jim Crow, so on and so forth. Well, in the same way, they would argue, this whole idea of same-sex marriage has been misrepresented by Christians. And having been misrepresented by Christians... There is a need for other people who are true Christians to shine the light of truth on what the Bible really says about homosexuality and same-sex relationships. And so that's why not only do we need to know what happened, but we also need to know what the Bible says and be able to defend against these attacks as well. Why address homosexuality? Listen to this from Matt Slick. We need to write about homosexuality because it is addressed in the Bible. It is a moral issue and it affects society. Therefore, it also affects religious and social institutions. As the influence of homosexuality increases, it will continue to invade our churches, our homes, our families, and affect change around us. Therefore, we need to have a rational and biblical defense for the Christian position as well as an examination of the problems that homosexuality brings. Folks, here's what you need to know. The homosexual community, one of the lies that they tell is the lie that says, no, 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 no. We just want our rights. We don't want to infringe on you. We don't want to infringe on the church. That is a lie from the pit of hell. If being a homosexual is the same thing as being a black person, and if it is wrong and illegal for anyone in the name of anything to discriminate against people because they are of a particular ethnicity, it only stands to reason that once this first case is made, that the laws must be brought to bear against Christians who hold to the biblical position on Christianity. There are no two ways about it. You cannot as a society on the one hand say, this is a civil right that must be protected. And on the other hand say, oh no, 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 church. You can violate civil rights. You can't do that. This is a lie, just like the lie that says, oh, no, 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 no. Same-sex marriage has nothing to do with polygamy. Nothing whatsoever to do with polyamory. That's a lie. 
once you follow the logic that gets you to same-sex marriage, you set a precedent that cannot be denied as it relates to polygamy. And once you follow the logic that says one's sexuality is the equivalent of one's ethnicity, you cannot but then apply these laws within the church and it becomes illegal to believe and teach what the Bible teaches about homosexuality. This is an inevitable reality. They cannot leave us alone. They must not leave us alone. So if we let them get away with this line of argumentation, we are next. L let me make that clear. If we let them get away with this line of argumentation, we are next. The church is next. The church cannot be left alone because if their argument is right, then we are violating the law, we are violating people's civil rights, and the law must come down on us and crush us. So know that this matters. This is of the utmost importance. Now let's look at some of these arguments that are being made against us. Jesus never spoke on homosexuality and other theological myths. Um, three main attacks. Well, really four main attacks. I say three. There's a, f a fourth I put on here. But um, number one, Jesus did not address homosexuality. That's the first one. Jesus didn't address homosexuality. So they come at us and they say, you guys are supposed to be Christians. You're supposed to be followers of Christ. Well, Jesus, your leader, didn't even mention homosexuality. Secondly, Paul didn't understand loving monogamous homosexuality. This is, the, this is part of the newest line of reasoning. You know, when Paul talked about homosexuality, he was actually talking about this vicious sort of either, you know, uh, pagan worship ritual, so it was ritual homosexuality, or it was the violation of young boys in Roman culture, but he would have known nothing of loving monogamous same-sex relationships, so that wouldn't have been what he was addressing. Third, the overarching ethic of Christianity is love. And so everything has to be interpreted through the overarching ethic of love, which means that when people love each other, they're actually being more Christian than you are when you're opposed to their love. And then finally, the one that I just, just added, we talked about it earlier, but we need to talk about it here as well. The whole you can't pick and choose. Um, there was a famous episode of the West Wing. And in this famous episode of the West Wing, there is a, a character, Jewish lady, supposed to be Dr. Laura, you know, who believes in homosexuality is an abomination. And the president just dresses her down. And basically what he does is, you know, he says, yeah, you know, I got a daughter. I want to sell into slavery. You know, uh, my brother-in-law, he, he likes to play football on, on, on the Sabbath. You know, do we stone him? And, you know, I got this and I got that. But the whole line of argumentation is you pick and choose from the Levitical law. How is it that you pick this from the Levitical law and you leave these other things from the Levitical law? So these are the four main lines of argumentation. But, and remember what's being done here. What's being done here is on the one hand, we're saying this is a civil rights issue. Being gay is just like being black. And on the other hand, we're saying, just like in the civil rights movement, where there are people who abuse the Bible in order to abuse their fellow man, there are people who have abused the Bible in order to abuse homosexuals, and now there are real Christians who are standing up and pointing out, you know, one of or all of these four issues that show us that that's what's happening. So let's deal with these. Number one, Jesus never spoke on homosexuality. Um, there's a couple of problems with this. Number one, Jesus did address homosexuality. He did address homosexuality. In Matthew chapter 5 and in Matthew chapter 19, when Jesus talks about divorce, and, and one of the, this is one of the sad realities of a culture that almost knows the Bible. When Jesus talks about, a, about a divorce, he says, you know, if you divorce your wife except for the cause of... Anybody? Huh? See, y'all go to GFBC, you cheating. We go, except for the cause of adultery. Nine out of ten Christians will say, Jesus said, except for the cause of adultery. 
Adultery in the Greek is moikia. That's not what he said. He said pornea, which is why the translations read, except for the cause of sexual immorality. Now, where do you find the pornea codes? There was no New Testament. So when Jesus says, except for the cause of pornea, he's talking about a, 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 a body of law that would have been well known. Where do you find the pornea codes? You find the pornea codes in the holiness codes in Leviticus 18 to 22. Well, interestingly enough, and here's why this is an interesting point, because those people who say Jesus never spoke about homosexuality, first of all, he did, but secondly, if that's your line of argumentation, that if it never came out of Jesus' mouth, it is therefore not sinful, um, Jesus never spoke about pedophilia. Jesus never spoke about rape. Jesus, Jesus never spoke about incest. So if we follow this line of reasoning, those things are to be accepted as well. But once you understand that Jesus references the pornea codes here, guess what else gets addressed? Rape, incest, bestiality, incest, all of these things get addressed because Jesus went to the pornea codes. So Jesus did address, hom address homosexuality. And he addressed a whole host of other sexual immoralities by pointing to the pornea code. But even beyond that, um, Jesus also addressed marriage and its definition. This goes to another variation of this argument. And these are the people who say, well, you know, there are only a handful of verses that mention homosexuality. If it's that big a deal, why do you only have a handful of verses that address it? Folks, every passage in the Bible that addresses marriage is addressing homosexuality. Amen? Everything in the creation account that addresses maleness and femaleness would thereby also address homosexuality. This is sleight of hand. This is deceitful. This is dishonest. Thirdly, Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. When you say, well, Jesus never addressed homosexuality, what you are doing is you're pitting the Father against the Son and the Spirit. As though somehow God is out there in the Old Testament just reckless, doing these dumb things. And then Jesus comes along and says, I don't know what dude was doing on the left side of the book, but let me tell you, here's how it really is. That's ridiculous. Folks, Jesus did not become God. He is God, always was God. He's the second person of the Trinity. He is eternally begotten of the Father. He is and was and is to come. What does this mean? Jesus was there in Leviticus and at Sodom and Gomorrah. Amen, somebody. Jesus was there. He was there. Finally, the Bible is a unit. Not only can you not pit the Son against the Father, you can't pit Jesus against Paul. Jesus never addressed, so, so what? The Bible is a unit. And we understand that the apostles are appointed by Christ. Amen? This is why we have a New Testament. This is why we know how to be Christians because of these instructions that we have from the apostles. So to make this argument is to pit the Father against the Son and the Spirit and to pit Jesus against Paul, both of which destroy hermeneutics altogether. This is sleight of hand. This is dishonesty, okay? What does Genesis teach us about marriage? Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. They shall become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Notice the categories we get here. We get man, we get father, mother. Then we get wife, man, wife. There are categories here. Marriage unites the two corresponding halves of humanity. It has always been designed to unite the two corresponding halves of humanity. It does not take a rocket scientist 
to figure out that we unite two halves of humanity, okay? You just do the math. It kind of works out. Not only that, look what else is here, one flesh. So even if you weren't sure, let's say God didn't give any instructions and here's Adam and here's Eve, they're both created and they're both naked and not ashamed, it wouldn't take very long for them to figure out what goes where and why. We got kids here, that's as far as I'm going, y'all, okay? It wouldn't take very long to figure it out. And then, just to make sure that they know, yes, this is right, in a few months there would be a verification. Amen? So then you know, in case you were wondering if that's how it's supposed to work, several months later you go, oh, that's what that's for. Yes. Amen. So the way God created humanity basically points to this. Folks, Jesus echoes this teaching. Matthew 19, 3 to 6. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, by the way, nouns have genders. People have sexes. Did you catch that? Nouns have genders. Masculine, feminine, neutered. People have sexes. Male and female. God made two sexes. He made them male and female. And he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast. He just defined the family and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. He just defined human sexuality. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. He just defines marriage. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. This is not just about the individual couple who's married. This is also about the very definition of marriage itself. God has joined together male and female. Let not man disunite male and female with anything remotely resembling same-sex so-called marriage. It's not marriage. This is marriage. Nothing else is marriage. Nothing else can be defined as marriage. God makes this clear in Genesis. And this is Jesus verifying his understanding of human sexuality, of the nature of male, maleness, of the nature of femaleness, of the nature of marriage, of the nature of the family, all of this right here. And he goes back to Genesis. So enough already of trying to divorce Jesus from the rest of scriptures. Genesis gives us the purposes of marriage and these purposes are clear procreation, illustration, and sanctification. Again, we understand that marriage is for the purpose of procreation. They be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. There's only one way you do that, and that is to bring the two corresponding halves together. Illustration. It is a picture of the unity of the triune God within the context and confines of the family. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who has existed eternally as the one true God in three persons. The Son eternally begotten of the Father. The Spirit proceeding eternally from the Father and the Son makes man in his image. And from the side of the man proceeds a woman and from their union proceeds children. This is an illustration. And then Jesus brings it out even further. It's an illustration of the relationship between Christ and his bride, the church. And then sanctification. God has made us sexual creatures, but he has given us marriage so that the expression of this happens within a context that is holy and not sinful. But here's the other thing. If we're going to argue that you define marriage based on people's orientation, then you have to include polygamy. Why? Because men and women, and men in particular, are oriented. You're not just oriented toward one person. You find other people attractive beside your own spouse. So if finding other males attractive makes you, by definition, a homosexual, does finding other females attractive make one, by definition, a polygamist? 
If the only thing that you use to define your orientation is your attraction, and then we're going to define what we see as marriage based solely upon your orientation, then the fact, again, people commit adultery at a higher rate than they commit homosexuality. Homosexuality is somewhere between 1% and 3% of the population. Adultery happens somewhere between 12 and 25% of marriages. So it would seem that if all we're worried about is orientation and people's desires and tendencies, polygamy makes a lot more sense than same-sex marriage, but we're not going there yet. Once we cross the first bridge, the second one is inevitable because by definition, that second bridge is based on the same premises as the first. So what's wrong with homosexuality? First, it violates the creation order. It violates the creation order. Secondly, it denounces procreation categorically. Categorically. Well, procreation, does that mean two people who are beyond childbearing years shouldn't be able to get married? Um, No, they should be able to get married. Why? Because categorically, they are the two halves of humanity that come together to make a one flesh union, and they are the two halves of of, of, of humanity that come together to make children. Therefore, categorically, they belong together. So yes, yes, they can get married, even if they can't produce children, because categorically, they belong together. It also blasphemes the illustration. It turns Christ on himself and the church on herself. It denies the need for sanctification because it takes what God calls an abomination and says it's not even sinful. And finally, it is a miserable existence. And we'll talk about that more later. No one who knows anything about the homosexual lifestyle and loves a person could celebrate the fact that they're in the homosexual lifestyle. It is a miserable existence. What about this love issue? What about this love issue? Because they want to argue from the Beatles, all you need is love. I'm going Tina Turner. What's love got to do with it, okay? (laughs) And so those who make this argument that basically what you have is this love ethic, they, they want to redefine Christianity by this love ethic, um, and everything is, everything is love. Well, there's two things that you need to know if you're going to talk about this love ethic. Because Jesus gave us this love ethic, right? There, what is the greatest commandment? You know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, love your neighbor as yourself. Love, 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 love. Um, just a minute. Here's how the discussion went in Matthew 22. They asked Jesus what was the greatest commandment. Now, there were several schools of thought, some who believed that the first commandment was the greatest commandment, some believed that it was the fifth because it was the bridge between the first and second tables of the law, and others who believed that it was the tenth because the tenth is against coveting, and coveting is really the source of your breaking of all the commandments. So Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Is it the first? Is it the fifth? Is it the tenth? Jesus' response is, the first and greatest commandment is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. By the way, that's a summary of the first four commandments. Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? I'm going to have to say one through four. But wait, there's more. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the second table of the law. That's five through ten. So those who say, you know, the great ethic in Christianity is the love ethic, I say, yes, amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. It is the love ethic. But when you understand that the first love, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, is a reference to the first table of the law, commandments one through four, and the second love, love your neighbor as yourself, is a reference to commandments five through 10, you have just ensnared yourself in your own trap. You still didn't get away from the moral law. Two lines of attack. The God is love line of attack and the marriage is love line of attack. On the one hand, God is love, and so anybody who loves anybody, um, that love needs to be celebrated. Again, you need to remember there's an organization called NAMBLA, the North American Man-Boy Love Association, and their motto is, eight is too late. That's the motto of the North American Man-Boy Love Association. 
And by the way, the same uh, American Psychiatric Association that declassified homosexuality in 1973 from being a disorder is now declassifying pedophilia as a disorder as well. And so Nambla's waiting in line for their turn to be acknowledged for their orientation. And the next one is marriage is love. But is this love? Is this love? Folks, true love hates sin. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 6. We love 1 Corinthians 13, right? We love to read it at weddings and everything, and everybody wants to talk about this. But listen, love is patient, love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It, does, it is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. True love cannot rejoice in homosexuality because homosexuality is by definition wrongdoing. So again, they argue that we're not loving when the fact of the matter is true love cannot and must not embrace homosexuality because it's wrongdoing. Psalm 9710, oh, you who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the lives of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Romans 12, 9 to 10, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Romans 1, 31 to 32, though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them but give approval to those who practice them. This is where you land when you embrace homosexuality. This is where you land. True love judges according to God's standard. You know, there's a new John 3.16. The old John 3.16 is John 3.16. Everybody knew that and was aware of it. The new John 3.16 is Matthew 7.1. Now, people don't know where Matthew 7.1 is, but they know, judge not lest you be judged. Right? Why are you judging? Stop judging. <laughs> okay, let's go there, shall we? Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? It's sounding bad for us, folks. I mean, it sounds like we just <laughs> need to leave people alone, right? <laughs> Why do we keep reading? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then leave your brother alone because that would be judging. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. It's not what it says. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Taking the speck out of your brother's eye is a metaphor for, come on, judging. The Bible does not teach that we're not supposed to judge. It teaches us how we're supposed to judge. When people bring that up, tell them, keep reading. True love calls the wicked to repent. True love calls the wicked to repent. Who loves their neighbor? The one who sees their neighbor's house on fire, runs over, beats on the door, and if they don't answer the door, kicks in the door and drags their neighbor out kicking and screaming, or the one who looks at their neighbor's house on fire and says, well, we really love him. Ezekiel 3.18, if I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life. That wicked person shall die for his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Here's what you need to know, folks. Not only can we not be silent on this issue because of its implications, but we also can't be silent on this issue because we love our neighbor. And loving your neighbor is telling him the truth when God says, for this you shall surely die. Acts 17, 29 to 31. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think 
that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. All people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Ephesians 5, 5 to 12. You may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. You know, some Christians think that we ought not even talk about this. The Bible says we're to expose these evil deeds. Therefore, true love must never treat homosexuality with anything less than utter contempt and loathing. Well, that didn't sound right. That's right, because we've been desensitized, jammed, and converted. That doesn't even sound Christian to us. You, you can't treat homosexuality like that. By the way, I didn't say you treat homosexuals like that, did I? I said you treat homosexuality like that. Why? Well, but wait a minute. But sin is sin, right? Because I get this a lot from Christians too. Why do you talk about this homosexuality stuff all the time, but you don't talk about other sins? Well, number one, <laughs> I do. Amen, somebody. <laughs> But number two, the other sins that I talk about don't have a lobby. Right? I mean, I talk about adultery. I don't have to worry about people, you know, coming and giving me death threats. I don't have to worry about them, you know, trying to, trying to harm my family. I don't have to worry about, you know, getting hate mail and all this. I don't have to worry about that. But homosexuality has its own lobby. It's different. Here's the other thing. Um, who said that from a temporal sense, all sin is the same? Wasn't Jesus. Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Folks, if sin is sin, why would Jesus talk about greater sin? The sin of worry is not equal to the sin of murder. Not all sins are called abominations. Homosexuality is unique. And even among the sins that are called abominations, there are some things that are an abomination to Israel, ceremonial law, and there are some things that are an abomination to God, moral law. Homosexuality falls into the second category of abomination. This, by the way, is why we can eat shrimp and not be homosexuals. Amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> Love me some shrimp and some hog, all right? <laughs> Amen, somebody, okay? There's a difference between something that's an abomination to Israel and something that's an abomination to God. Paul, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. It's not the same. Sexual immorality is not the same. By the way, no other sin resulted in the fiery destruction of Twin Cities. Homosexuality is unique, y'all. No other sin received that kind of response from God ever. And homosexuals received a penalty in their flesh, according to Romans chapter 1. Tell me another sin where the Bible says you receive a penalty in your flesh. And this goes to the miserable lifestyle that we talked about before. Homosexuals have extremely high rates of STDs and some unique ones as well, as well as other maladies that are not STDs that we won't even go in 
because of not just the young ears that are here, but just because I don't even want to hear about it. Homosexuals have extremely high rates of alcoholism and drug addiction, higher than the norm. They have extremely high rates of suicide. By the way, they also have extremely high rates of domestic violence. It's ironic that the feminist movement is taking advantage of this opportunity that they have, you know, with the NFL and all these other stuff, to, to press their idea that men are predators from whom women need to be protected. Um, women in same-sex relationships are victimized at higher rates in domestic violence than are women in relationships with men. Another woman is much more dangerous to a female than a man. It's a myth that men are the predators. It's a myth. It's a myth. Same-sex couples have much higher rates of domestic violence than do the rest of the population. Homosexual men take 20 to 30 years off their life expectancy. Homosexuality is not a lifestyle. It's a death style. And this is why I repeat, if you love your neighbor, this is to be treated with contempt and loathing. It is a miserable existence. In the Old Testament, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Why is this important? This is important because those who argue, well, actually, you know, Paul didn't understand loving same-sex relationships. Paul was only responding to the idea of these abusive relationships, either that abused boys or they were uh, temple prostitution type things. The foundation for what Jesus said about homosexuality and for what Paul said about homosexuality is the Levitical Code. The, the Levitical Code here is not talking about any particular heart condition and the way people feel toward one another. It is talking about the fact that sex is to unite the two halves of humanity. It's wrong because you're uniting the same halves. If a man lies with a man, a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. We talked on last night about the whole concept of general equity, which is very important. So I would just refer you back to that because there are those who say, oh, well, now you want to put people to death. Da, 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 da. Go back to what we said on last night talking about general equity. Ezekiel 16. Uh, by the way, notice here that Leviticus 18, 22, 20, and 13, also uh, Genesis 19 and Judges 19 are passages that you want to look at there. In Ezekiel 16. Because here's people, people want to make this argument. Well, actually, the sin of sodomy, the sin of Sodom wasn't sodomy. They, 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 they were in trouble because they weren't hospitable. It says so in Ezekiel. As I live, declares the Lord God, your sister Sodom and her daughters have not done as you and your daughters have done. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excessive food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and the needy. There you have it right there. A couple of things. Ezekiel is a prophetic book. You don't read it the same way. This is an apocalyptic book. And the third thing is, it's not the only place that Sodom is spoken of. Because the New Testament kind of addresses that too. Jude 7. Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality, pornea, and pursued unnatural desires, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So the New Testament says the fire came down because of sodomy, unnatural desires. By the way, against nature, unnatural desires, this also explodes this whole myth that, well, Paul didn't understand loving relationships. No, people's disposition toward one another is not the issue. The issue is that it's unnatural for men to be with men and for women to be with women. Romans 1, 
26 and 27. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. This is clear. This has nothing to do with whether or not it was at the temple or whether or not it was with boys. or Men with men. We're not talking about boys here. 1 Timothy 1, 9 and 10. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their parents, strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, sexually immoral men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. So so why do you eat shellfish and shave your beard? This goes back to that whole thing of you just, you pick and choose. Um, Interestingly enough, those people who are saying that we pick and choose, we must not let them get away with this because they pick and choose. Watch this. Those who strike their fathers and mothers. People who don't agree with us on homosexuality think it's wrong for people to strike their fathers and mothers as well. They think murder is wrong. The sexually immoral. There's somewhere that they think sexuality can be immoral. They think slavery is wrong because it's man-stealing, violation of the Eighth Commandment. They think lying is wrong, and they think perjury is wrong. So they want to uphold all of those things on the list, but not this one. Who's picking and choosing? They're picking and choosing. Don't let them get away with that. Why do you pick and choose? Why do you pick and choose? I can tell you why I pick and choose. I have a hermeneutic, a science of interpretation. I understand that there are three categories of law in the Old Testament, that there is moral and civil and ceremonial. I understand the way you interpret those laws in the Old Testament and apply them to today. So when I pick and choose, I do so because of a careful, disciplined hermeneutic. Why do you pick and choose? Why do you pick and choose? You pick and choose because of what you want. That means one of us is being selfish and dishonest, and it ain't me. Don't let them get away with this, folks. They pick and choose. Not only there, but in the Old Testament. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the, son, against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is what they want to uphold. By the way, that's Leviticus 19. Same holiness code where we find homosexuality. Why is it that the people who get on us for picking and choosing can pick and choose this from Leviticus and not homosexuality? Please see this. The next time somebody gets on you for picking and choosing, number one, I have a reason for what I pick and what I choose. I understand that the shaving of the beard was part of the ceremonial law, distinguishing Israel as a people from people who surrounded them and shaved their heads and beards in a very specific way to identify them as worshipers of their God. I understand that therefore that does not apply to me directly, but indirectly in terms of idolatry. I get that. But why do you pick and choose? I have a hermeneutical reason to pick and choose. And I'm consistent when I go through the Old Testament as to how and why I pick and choose. But why do you pick and choose? Well, I'm not picking and choosing. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You're just not honest enough to acknowledge that the very thing to which you are attempting to hold comes from my worldview and my Bible. But since you didn't knowingly get it from my Bible, I'm supposed to give you a pass. No, I'm afraid I can't do that. You're picking and choosing and you don't know why. You're wrong, not me. We understand those divisions of the law. 
and that it's those divisions of the law. So what do we do? Press the law and point to Christ. That's what we do. Folks, know something here. I'm not sharing this so that we can win debates and win arguments. That's not enough. Our goal and our job is to win souls. It's not enough for me that homosexuals are not allowed to marry. That's not enough. I'm not okay with what this death style is doing to people. I'm not okay with the fact that now we are confusing younger and younger children by applying laws and rules even down to elementary school about gender confusion and sexual orientation and transgender this, that, and the other. I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay that when we do that, we open children up to molestation by people who prey on young, confused children. I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with what we're doing with our marriage laws. By the way, I'm not okay with rampant divorce, which also undermines and devalues marriage. I'm not okay with that. I can't be okay with that. But it's not enough for me that we have the right laws on these issues. Because men can be homosexuals and not get married and go to hell, and that's not okay with me. That's not okay with me. My problem with this is that it offends God. And my desire is not only that people would stop offending God, but that they would know God and find forgiveness. And so when we bring these things up, Remember that the law is a tutor. The law points us to Christ. It's a beautiful thing. When you can bring somebody here, you know, and you can go, yeah, because, you know, in Leviticus 19, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what you're arguing for, right? You're arguing for Leviticus 19. Love your neighbor as yourself. Have you done that? Have you done that rightly? Have you done that perfectly? Can you stand guiltless before God on that part of Leviticus? Let's just leave the other part of Leviticus known, alone for a minute. Let's talk about the part of Leviticus that you're pressing on me. How are you doing in that right there? Is there any animosity in your heart toward me right now? Because Jesus says that's the same as murder. So if you've got animosity in your heart toward me right now, then you're acknowledging by the part of Leviticus to which you hold that you are guilty before God and deserve the fires of hell. You need Christ. We can talk about the homosexuality part later. But right now, let's just deal with what you already acknowledge that you agree with from the Levitical Code. Press the law and get to Christ. This is about the gospel. This is not about winning elections. This is about winning souls. This is not about people not doing what I don't like. This is about God being honored. This is about my desire to not see this land that I love experience what it deserves right now. Because the fact of the matter is, I don't know who said it, but it's absolutely right. If God does not destroy America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. We are a wicked, wicked nation. And God is having mercy on us. But for how much longer? How much longer will we abide under the mercy of God? And when there are people in the name of Christ who are making these silly arguments against what God says clearly about homosexuality, folks, we're in trouble. And this is not about winning the next election. Because we can do that and still be in trouble. Because the solution to these problems do not work themselves out from the top down. They do not work themselves out from Washington. 
These things are dealt with in the heart of man through the proclamation of the gospel when God, by his grace, awakens and ignites and saves a wicked sinner who deserves death, hell, and the grave and says, my son paid for that. That's my desire for the homosexual. Christ died for sin once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us back to God. All we like sheep had gone astray. Each of us had turned to his own way, but God hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Folks, the blood of Jesus is sufficient to cover homosexuality. Amen. This is not an us and him us and them thing. This is a right and wrong thing. This is a truth and error thing. This is a gospel thing. And we must always remember that. Every one of these things gives us an opportunity to point people toward Christ. Yeah, well, Jesus never addressed homosexuality. Yes, he did. This gives us an opportunity to point him to who Jesus is, point him to the Trinity, and preach the gospel. Yeah, well, Paul didn't understand, you know, loving same-sex relationships. Yes, he did. This gives us an opportunity to unite Christ and Paul and the Bible itself and that unified message of redemption that we find. Yeah, well, you know, the central ethic of the Bible is love. Yes, yeah, absolutely it is. And God has demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But know this, Christ kept the whole law, the first table of the law and the second table of the law. And he's righteous because he kept those things. Yeah, well, you pick and choose. Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, there's a pretty, pretty clear reason that we do that. And there's a pretty clear way that we do that. But here's the news. You do that as well. And here's what I want to know. Are you even keeping the law that you're choosing to try to impose on me? And if you're not, what does that say about you and God? Press the law, point to Christ, get to the gospel. And by all means, don't back down. There's too much at stake. Let's pray. God, our gracious and merciful Heavenly Father, we bow before you as a humble and grateful people, thanking you for your mercy, acknowledging and recognizing the fact that all we like sheep have gone astray. Every last one of us deserved the fires of hell. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ. By grace we have been saved. And for that we're grateful. Grant by your grace that we might celebrate this truth and proclaim it from the mountaintops. We pray this because we believe it to be in accordance with the will and the nature and the authority of Jesus, who is the Christ, our Lord, Savior, Master, Redeemer, and soon coming King. In his name, amen.